Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been tuning in over the past month, you know that we have been taking a deep dive into extreme environments. So talking to scientists and explorers who explore these areas to bring back really awesome media, research, information, and stories uh, for us. These areas could be extreme because they're hard to reach. They could be extreme because it's difficult for life to live there. There's all kinds of things that can make uh, an environment extreme. So we're really excited uh, today to be joined by uh, Kevin McLean. Kevin is an ecologist studying mammals that live in the canopy of the rainforest. He climbs into the treetops and uses motion sensitive cameras to document species that uh, we rarely see from the ground. So he's worked in some of the most biodiverse places on the planet, including Malaysia, Ecuador, and Panama. And the canopy of the rainforest is a pretty amazing spot. There's so many areas left to explore up there, so much for us to learn. There's countless new species uh, ready to be discovered in this largely unexplored ecosystem. So Kevin, it's so great to have you join us live today. Some of the classrooms may remember we had Kevin with one of our satellite units dangling in a tree 70 feet above in the canopy in Panama. So it's nice to see you on the ground. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better today, Kevin. Yeah, hopefully the connection will be a little bit better this time. All right, absolutely. Well, Kevin, we've got a great group of classrooms from across North America in Canada and the US hanging out with us today. And uh, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit before we jump to some Q&A action. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm excited that you guys are all able to join today. Um, I have, uh, I was just going to do a little bit of an introduction to the kind of work I've been doing. I'm going to try and share, share this slideshow with you guys. Hopefully, Joe, let me know if if things are, are coming through or not. Um, let's see. So Joe, can you can you guys see see all of that? Yeah, we're full screen now. Good to go. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so I'm I'm an ecologist. I, I'm a canopy canopy researcher. So I spend a lot of time um, up in the trees. I don't know if this the this video is coming through, but the canopy is like a really important part of the forest. A lot of the mammals that live in, in rainforests either live up there their whole lives or they eat up there or sleep up there, they find nests up there. So it's a super important part of the forest, but it's an area of the forest that we don't know a lot about because you can see here it's it's pretty difficult to access. It takes a lot of time and energy uh, to get up there. So I, um, I will uh, set up these uh, motion sensitive cameras. They're called camera traps. Um, and so I'll set these cameras up up in the branches and when animals walk by it'll take photos of them and then we can use all of those photos that the, those cameras take um, to see what kinds of species are up there and how many of them are up there and if we keep setting them up uh, year after year we can see whether the populations of those animals are changing or not. Um, so it's really some basic information about uh, about animals up in the trees but it's stuff that we really we really won't know unless we, we spend time up and up in the, in this environment. Um, so in order to do all of this work, I, I had to learn how to climb trees and, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, swinging from branches like just like I was doing in, in our last our last classroom, um, uh, Explorer classroom. And um, so I, you know, the, the work that I do requires a lot of training to, to learn how to do this and a lot of, um, you know, time and energy spent like climbing up into the trees um, but it's actually not all that different from how I spent my time when I was growing up so I was uh, when I was little I was a really really energetic child I, I did gymnastics uh, competitively when I was a kid and I switched I switched into diving when I was older um, so like being active and being uh, being outdoors was always like a big part of my life um, and I've been really lucky to be able to continue doing a lot of that um, as an adult. Um, but I wanted to talk with you guys today a little bit about uh, the, um, a, a, the most recent trip that I had uh, where I spent, I spent about a year split between Malaysia and Ecuador. Um, and so, and these are two of the places that have some of the most biodiverse forests in the world. Um, I was in, in mostly in Borneo, in Malaysia, which is uh, in Southeast Asia. And then I was in the Amazon in Ecuador. Um, and in, in Malaysia, the forests there are really, really interesting, especially for a canopy biologist, because you see these giant trees that stick up above the rest of 
uh, the rest of the forest. And in, there's this lower canopy that has a lot of trees that are really closely connected. Um, and you can see animals like this is a, called a cream colored giant squirrel. Um, and it's kind of, it's hard to tell from this photo, but um, it's actually about the size of a house cat. It's one of the largest squirrels in the world. Um, and they, they're actually, they're really shocking to see, uh, see in, in person because you just don't expect to see a squirrel that large. Um, there's also uh, monkeys like this. Uh, this is called a, a pig-tailed macaque. They have like a, a short little tail, like, like how a pig would, would have one. Um, and they, they move through the forest in uh, really, really, uh, sometimes big groups are really loud. They can be, be a little bit destructive sometimes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they are, are group living animals. Um, and they, they get really curious and they check out the cameras a little bit. It doesn't really alter their behavior or anything. Um, they still will pass on by, but they, they definitely notice that the cameras are there. They check them out and then they keep on going about their day. So um, yeah, and this is, uh, this is another, another monkey species. This is called a, a dusky leaf monkey. It was one of my favorites, although um, it kind of has, has a, a crazy smile. But um, but yeah, this is a this is another species. Um, they're they're a type of primate called a langur. Um, uh, langurs. There's a bunch of different langur species ar around the uh, around Southeast Asia and in Africa. Um, but uh, but yeah, they they have the, this black color when they're adults. But the babies are are like a bright gold color, so they really stick out um, when you see them in, in the wild. Um, and actually at night you see animals like this. This is uh, called a, um, a slow loris. Um, it's one of the few uh, um, poisonous mammals in the world. So it actually has a little gland on its, on its elbow where it produces a poisonous oil and it can, can use that. It mixes it with its saliva. So if it bites you, um, it can actually uh, give you a bite kind of like a snake. Um, so it's pretty can be a pretty dangerous animal to encounter, but they're they're really really interesting to see. Um, and then yeah, I mentioned those giant those big big tall trees that they have. Um, the species that live in those big tall trees um, are it's a lot of they have a lot of flying squirrels there. So this is this is called a red giant flying squirrel. Um, this one actually it's a little bit bigger than that that other squirrel I showed you. Um, this one actually is the largest squirrel in the world. Um, also about the size of a house cat. They can, they, they jump from one of these giant trees and they can glide about the length of a football field um, to land on another tree. And then they, they uh, climb up that tree and launch themselves over to the next place. So it's a pretty, they're pretty interesting animals to see for sure. And they can, they're really, really agile in the air. Um, they, they jump, they glide, and then they can kind of steer themselves. They don't actually fly, they can't flap flap their uh, any wings or anything like that but they can really control where they where they glide in the forest um, yeah this is this is another another type of giant flying squirrel black giant flying squirrel this is sort of facing down the trunk of the tree another one of my favorite animals um, and you can see they've, they've landed down at the bottom and they're launching themselves up the trunk of the tree so they can jump again um, so I got, I, when I was working in Southeast Asia, I got really, really into studying flying squirrels. Um, this is another one. This is a pygmy flying squirrel. They're, um, they're the smallest squirrel species in the world. They weigh about 22 grams, which is around this, the, the weight of a, a double A battery. Um, they're really, really tiny squirrels, um, but they live in the same, the same giant trees as the giant flying squirrels. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then so I spent about half the year in Malaysia and then went over to Ecuador to the Amazon, um, where I got to see a lot of my, uh, my other uh, favorite animals. Um, they have a lot, of, a lot of primate species, a lot of monkey species. This is called a, a woolly monkey. Um, they, they're also a group living animal, so you'll see them in groups of like 10 or 12 moving through the trees. Um, this is uh, called a, a, a spider monkey. Um, they're, they're named that because they have these really, really long limbs, long arms, long legs, a super long tail. So they kind of, they look like a giant spider a little bit when they're, they're swinging through the trees. Um, oh, these are uh, red howler monkeys. Um, so howler monkeys are actually, they're the loudest land mammal on earth. You can hear them calling from four miles away. So it can be, uh, you, you definitely know when they're around, but it can be really alarming when they start calling 
when you're in the tree with them or something. They, they're, they're, not, they're not super aggressive, but they're very, very loud, so. Um, and again, at, at night, there's tons and tons of animals that come out. This animal is called a kinkajou. They're actually related to raccoons, even though they don't really look like them. Um, this is uh, this is called an owl monkey. It's uh, it's actually the the only nocturnal monkey species, uh, or the only nocturnal type of monkey. Um, they have a really really long tail, uh, long bushy tail that sort of helps them balance up in the trees. And you can see they have those big eyes that help them reflect light so they can see at night. Oh, that one's me. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Um, and then this is this is another special animal that that uh, we got on our cameras. It's called a bushy-tailed possum, um, and it's a really really rare animal to see. Um, there's tons of different possum species in uh, in uh, South America and Central America, and this one um, was it was first discovered about a hundred years ago and had really only been seen a handful of times in the last hundred years. Um, and we, we found uh, like eight or nine different documentations of, of this species, um, which was really special to see. Nobody had collected photos of them with camera traps before. There's very, very few photos of them alive in the wild. So um, this was a really special, special animal to get to, to see. Um, but yeah, and, and just, uh, just, you know, to be clear, there, there are lots of things that make doing this kind of work really, really difficult um, and really, uh, Sometimes a little bit, uh, a little bit dangerous. On the the upper left, you can see there's a a bunch of bees that decided to hang out on my back while I was up in the tree one time. Uh, on the upper right, there's a, a big branch that uh, that cracked off and and fell. It almost fell right on top of me, which which wasn't wasn't a great day. Um, lots of ants you can sort of see in the bottom bottom right. Um, and in in Southeast Asia, especially, there are lots of leeches. So there's a leech that's crawling on a on a little uh, banister there uh, in in Malaysia. That one I had picked off of my uh, off of my shoulder late at the end of the day. Another leech that found its way into my nose one day. So um, there's lots of reasons not not to do this kind of work. But if you don't get yourself out there and try to explore a little bit, then we're never going to know anything about this part of the forest. So um, so yeah, it's there's definitely reasons not to do it. But um, but I, for me. The, um, the benefits and like what we actually can discover far outweigh all of the inconveniences of actually getting out into this environment. So um, let's see, let me, I'll go back. So those are, that's all the, all the, the sort of slides that I have, but, um, but yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of what I've done recently with you, with you guys. Oh, Kevin, that's perfect. That's, that's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. I love, those photos of the hazards of spending time <laughs> in the rainforest and going up in the canopy. Um, Kevin, before we meet some of our classrooms, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your technique for getting up into the trees? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, in order to get into the tree, I start obviously have to start off on the ground. I actually have, um, I have an eight foot tall slingshot that um, I put a little weight bag in the slingshot and the weight bag is attached to a string and I shoot that weight bag over a branch. Um, the string goes over the branch and then I can use that string to pull my rope up. And then um, I'll tie the rope off on the ground and then I can climb up the other end of the rope. So we do a lot of like safety checking for uh, the branches that we're climbing. I do a pretty pretty extensive safety check around the tree that I'm gonna climb. And then you, you use some binoculars, you check out where the rope is set um, and then you test it a bunch of times. I'll get two, maybe two other people to uh, grab the rope with me and we bounce up and down on the rope. It's called a bounce test, just, just to see whether, whether the, the branch is gonna hold. Um, and then at some point, you know, you just have to, you just have to start going up there and, and then you see. Um, there's no, usually, most of the trees that I'm climbing, nobody else has ever climbed before. So there's no guarantee that, that everything is gonna be perfect. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we try and, we try and be as safe as possible in, in doing all this work just to minimize the risks that are already there. All right. Perfect. Well, Kevin, I think it's time to meet some of our classrooms. Obviously you can see we have a great group of classrooms here on video with us, but I don't want to forget our YouTube community. So there's a ton of classrooms who are tuning in live uh, via YouTube right now. 
And I apologize to the classrooms who had to make a little shift. Uh, one of our YouTube accounts wasn't cooperating this morning, so we had to uh, jump on and start the event on another account. So I'm glad most of the classrooms look like they found their way over. So I'm gonna give a shout out to a few classrooms here. Whew, here we go. Miss Sheffield's grade fours are hanging out with us in Ontario. In Boston, we've got uh, Mr. Uh, Lacchiato's class. Let's see, we've got Nelson High School tuning in with us. Mr. Dota's second graders and Mississauga, Ontario are hanging out with us. We've got a class at St. Anne in Bartlett, Tennessee. So lots of classrooms hanging out with us. Uh, if any classrooms haven't introduced themselves, take a minute and do so, and I'll do another shout out in a moment. But let's jump to our first live classroom and take a question. Let's go to our classroom. We've got a classroom hanging out with in, in Ontario with Mrs. Mossman. Let me get her microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Mrs. Mossman Cross? We're doing great. How are you? We're good. good. Okay, so we have Danica here. <laughs> I ask a question. What's your favorite animal to see? Oh, um, hi, Danica. Uh, yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, I will say it, it can sometimes be pretty rare to see animals out in the wild. Um, I, I go out there in the middle of the day when a lot of animals are sleeping. Um, so I don't, it's not, I, I'll go into the trees and I don't, many times I don't see any animals at all. Um, but I think one of my, one of my favorite experiences was, um, I, I was climbing into a tree, uh, it was a, a fig tree actually, that was producing a lot of fruit. So there were a lot of animals that wanted to be in that tree, in that tree while I was there. But I'm, I'm something that is like totally foreign to them. They don't, they're not used to seeing something like me up in the tree. So when I started climbing, there were some howler monkeys and capuchin monkeys in the tree. And as soon as I got up there, they ran away to other trees. But then over the course of the time that I was up there setting up cameras, they all started coming back. And they, you know, animals look really confused seeing, seeing me up there, but it is really, really special to actually be in their environment watch uh, like watch them kind of get used to me being there and then watch them go back to doing what they were doing before so um yeah i think i it's it's really special to see any animals up there uh monkeys or or i've seen i've seen sloths up there before as well and i know we usually think of sloths as being really really slow animals which they are but they're also really well equipped to live up in the trees so i was trying to set up one camera and in the time I set that camera up, the there was a sloth in a tree next to me. It climbed into my tree, and then it climbed all the way over to another tree. So uh, compared to me, that sloth moves really, really fast in the trees. All right. That sloth has a little bit of an advantage of being <laughs> a little better built and suited yeah. for the canopy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Very cool. Well, I think I can catch up on our YouTube shout outs uh, right now. There we go. Uh, shout out to grade six sevens hanging out in Clinton, Ontario. We've got Miss uh, Tynan's grade sevens hanging out in Mississauga. We've got another group at Three Oaks Elementary in Virginia Beach. And then we've also got Mrs. Estes and Mrs. Uh, Marine's class in Roxborough, California. Oh, and Mrs. Hoyt's sixth grades in, in Wheatland Elementary. So tons of classrooms tuning in. And I'm going to grab a question from them right now. So Mrs. Dota's class is wondering about the pictures at night. How can you get those pictures and videos at night? How does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's another really good question. So um, so the cameras that I use, they have an infrared flash, um, which means for our eyes, all we really see is sort of like a little a light red, uh, red glow, um, but it's actually putting out infrared light. And then the camera itself has an infrared sensor. So um, it's sort of creating a, a flash that like we don't see with, with our eyes, um, which is really helpful because then the animals, it, it, it means the animals aren't gonna like change their behavior. Sometimes when you, when you use like a regular white light flash, like what we have on our cameras, it can, if you've ever taken a picture like that at night, um, it can sort of like blind you a little bit and then you can't really see in the dark very well for a little while. And if you do that to animals, they, um, they get scared and they won't return to that, that place. But when you use this infrared flash, um, then it doesn't bother them. They, um, they just con sort of continue doing their normal thing. Um, and then that's what allows us to study their natural behavior. Um, but that's also why those, those nighttime photos are in black and white. So we can't see color, we just see 
the images of the animals themselves. All right, great question from YouTube and I'll check back in a little bit, but let's visit uh, some more of our camera classes. So this time we're gonna go to Mrs. Deer's class. They're in Chesapeake, Virginia, some grade sevens hanging out with us. There's their mic. How are we doing, Virginia? We're doing well, we're a little glitchy. Go ahead, speak on. What type of education do you need to do this type of career? Um, yeah, that's another good question. I spent a lot of time in school. So my, my background is in ecology, which uh, ecology and environmental science. So um, ecology is sort of is the study of how organisms relate to the, the rest of their environment. It's uh, sort of in, uh, within, within the banner of biology, I'd say. Um, so I, I studied um, actually as an, uh, as an undergrad when I was in college, um, I studied marine ecology. Um, I was studying animals that lived on coral reefs. Um, and then I went on to graduate school. And when I, when, I, uh, when I started graduate school, I decided to start studying animals in, in forests. But there's a lot of different ways to actually get involved in, uh, in research, whether that's in canopies or in any other sort of ecosystem. Um, there's, there are plenty of people that do it without, without having gone to college at all. Um, many people will, will get research experience while they're in college and then find new ways to pursue that afterwards. Um, but there's so many different roles to, to play um, in doing research or uh, protecting animals or, or taking care of animals or, or whatever that is. So it, it, there's, there are many, many different jobs uh, in in areas that that uh, that help you study and understand the environment. So the path I took was through. Uh, I went to college, went to graduate school, um, did a PhD. Um, but there are a lot of people that that do it in a completely different way. So it it uh, is often just sort of what what works for you and what um, what kinds of uh, interests you have. Um, I, I know plenty of people that got really interested in, in working with animals in, in say, in, in Ecuador, in one of the places I worked in Ecuador. And they started doing that right out of high school and then just have continued doing it. So it just depends on, on what, what your goals are and, and where you wanna be. All right, well, Kevin, that's something we talk a lot about during our Explorer Classroom sessions is there is no right or wrong way to get into science. Everybody's got a different story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you start with one thing and end up on a totally different in a totally different area that totally takes yeah. you by surprise. So, <laughs> all right, let us go visit some fifth graders. They are joining us in Sudbury, it looks like, with Mrs. Lucy Antonio. Let me get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Sudbury? <laughs> How tall are most of the trees that you climb? Um, yeah, that also that depends on the forest, but I think um, remember those those big tall trees I was talking about in Southeast Asia with the flying squirrels. So those ones are actually those are the tallest tropical trees in the world. Um, and those trees can grow up to like 250 feet or so. Um, and so I would climb to around 160 180 feet something like that. Um, so you're you're really really high up there. Um, it's kind of it's like being um, let's see it's probably like being maybe at the top of like a 15 story building or something like that. Um, so it you 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 go up there really really high. It really puts things in perspective. You realize how um, how much of how much of the forest exists like way way above the ground. So um, but sometimes sometimes I'm in smaller trees. Uh, Usually I'm trying to get to the very, you know how like a tree, the trunk of the tree goes up like this and then you have the crown like that. And I'm aiming for like the very center of the crown because that's where the most branches are connecting to other trees nearby. So I'm, I'm never really going to the very top because those branches are small and wouldn't support me. So I'm trying to go to the very middle of the crown of the tree. Um, and, uh, and usually, you know, depending in Ecuador, the trees are a little bit shorter and usually maybe around uh, 80 to 100 feet. Um, and then in Southeast Asia, I was in really, really tall trees. So, yeah. All right, another great question. Uh, let's see, where should we go next? Let's take a little trip now to Mr. Taylor's class, some high school students hanging out with us in Niagara Falls here in Canada. Let's turn that microphone on. How are we doing, Niagara Falls? Hello. Good. <laughs> All right, who's got a question for Kevin? Have you ever 
Have you ever like been attacked by any type of animal? <laughs> um, I would say so. I've had a couple of close calls with like bigger animals. There, um, I don't know if you remember the the spider monkey picture that I showed you. The the one with the like, really really long arms and long long legs and tail. So they. Uh, there's a group of them on an island I work at in Panama that has been known to sort of give give researchers some trouble. They'll come and like steal things from their bags and stuff. Um, and I was out in a tree one time uh, and I could hear a lot of rustling nearby. And I was hoping that it was, um, I was hoping it was howler monkeys because howler monkeys, like I said, they make a lot of noise, but they're not aggressive and they're not, they kind of just, they're they're pretty lazy. They they sit around and 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 everything. So I was hoping it was that those, um, but just to be safe, there was another person in the tree with me, and I sent her down to the ground right away. Um, and then I spotted the spider monkeys, and they were moving really fast, coming from like uh, several trees over, moving towards me. They they get a little bit territorial, so they didn't want me up in the tree with them with them. So they I saw that it was these spider monkeys, and I started going down. Um, by the time I got about halfway down my rope, they were at the top of my rope. And they're like, they're really agile. So I didn't know if they were going to climb down my rope or do what or do whatever. Um, but I, I just kept going down the rope. Um, and what they ended up doing is grabbing the top of my rope and swinging me back and forth. So I'm still trying to get down to the ground. And I'm just swinging all over the place because these monkeys are grabbing my rope and shaking it all over. Um, but that's sort of that's the closest I've come to any kind of any kind of like negative interaction, I guess. But um, I mean, and then you know, there's 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 like you know, bees and wasps and and ants. Ants are really the worst thing because um, uh, because I'm usually in fruit trees. Um, there are a lot of trees that have um, sort of like a, a symbiotic relationship with ants, so the ants will protect the tree. So um, I'll be climbing up the tree, and then all of these ants will be coming down my rope, trying to bite me as I'm as I'm climbing up. So those are those are the main things. I'd say it's it's very common for me to get attacked by ants or other bugs, and very infrequent to to see other animals that that are aggressive. So. All right. Very cool. Shaken up by the monkeys. <laughs> all right. So let's visit another classroom. We're going to go to. Let's see, let's go to Colorado this time. We have some third and fourth graders hanging out with us uh, with Mrs. Rutkowski's. Let me turn her microphone on. There it is. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> Come on, Kathleen. Go. You're on. Um, what is the most patterned camouflaged animal you've seen in the canopy? Oh, man, that's another really good question. Um, so I, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of insects that um, that have very, really like close pattern to uh, to the um, the bark of the trees. Um, so there there are these uh, these um, um, arachnids. They're like a, a type of spider. Actually, they they're called a, a tailless whip scorpion, um, and they flatten out. Uh, they get really really flat. They actually like hide under it, between the creases of the bark um, of different trees. Um, and sometimes they'll hide underneath the cameras that I've placed. Um, and it's if you just like go by them, you would never be able to see that they're there. It's once they kind of get scared and they move around, that's when you can start to see them. But a lot of different species use camouflage to their advantage. There's um, I've seen some lizards that that really really blend in with the the trunks of the trees. Um, and and then actually also I mean sloths. That's actually a big part of their their defense is to, to not only be slow, but they, uh, when they kind of curl up into a ball and sleep, they, they look a lot like, um, like a termite nest just hanging on, on the end of a branch. Um, so lots of different species use camouflage in different ways just to blend in with their surroundings. All right, so I'm gonna grab a question or two from YouTube. There are tons of questions coming in <laughs> uh, via YouTube. So I apologize, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we'll try and grab uh, two, we'll hit you with two right now here, Kevin. Okay. Uh, the first one is, uh, one class is wondering, after a day uh, in the canopy, how do you find your way back to camp? Have you ever been lost before? And then the other class is wondering about climate change. Does that have an impact on the canopy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, both both really good questions. So um, as far as like navigating through the forest, we, we always have, um, 
have a GPS unit that we bring with us. Um, so, and that sort of tracks where we have gone. Um, a lot of times we try and we try and go on trails that other researchers have set up, which is really helpful. But a lot of times we end up having to go off of that trail. So we will um, we'll have that GPS unit that sort of tracks where we go. But you know you can't always rely on electronics when you're out out in the field. So we will also. Um, we also like have a, a paper map that we bring with us so that we're keeping track of where we're going on the map. And then um, sometimes we'll, we'll use, uh, it's called flagging tape. It's like these little sort of strips of, of tape that we'll tie around a branch. Um, and then as we, as we go, so that when we turn around, we can see all the flags of where we've gone. And then you, you just collect those flags when you leave. Um, but it's sort of like a, a uh, just, we try and, we try and do as many, uh, as many, uh, have as many safety protocols in there so that we, we're not ever getting super lost in the forest. Um, but, you know, it, it, it certainly can happen. And, and there have been, been researchers that uh, at some of the stations I've worked at before that just got turned around in the middle of the night and then uh, had to sort of wait until daytime in, in order to get themselves out, um, which is never, never a situation you want to be in. Um, so and then uh, and then oh yeah the other question was about about climate change yeah I, I mean it there's there are so many different ways that that climate uh, is affecting forests all over the world um, and in general like the 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 canopy itself is, is um, it's it starts off being a little bit drier than than uh, the forest down on the ground um, and and a lot of that is just because it's it's more exposed to to light and everything. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, so there's, there, it depends on where you are in, um, in the world. There are some, some areas where, uh, where the forests themselves are expected to be, to, uh, become wetter because of how, how climate is shifting. Other places are expected to get drier. It just depends on the, the, uh, patterns in that specific region. Um, the areas that I think are, are really, really, um, at risk are places where that are on uh, mountain slopes. So there are some some cloud forests in Ecuador, for example, that um, that really rely on these this uh, really dense layer of of clouds that come through. There, it's like they would be up in the sky if you were at sea level, but because the mountains are up so high, the clouds hit hit the forest um, as they move across uh, across the um, the landscape, and and so those forests are really really um, uh, the, a lot of the species in those forests are really, really specialized to this very, um, very moist um, uh, environment, and and that those areas, those forests are really drying up um, pretty quickly. So there's certain areas that are at really high risk, and others that are a little bit more uh, more tolerant. Um, but it really just depends on on the region and the type of forest. All right, perfect. Another awesome series of questions from online. There's so many coming in, Kevin. We have a ton of classrooms tuning in and hanging out with us today. Uh, where do we need to go next? Let's go to Downers Grove, Illinois. We've got some second graders hanging out in Mrs. Redpath's class. Let me get their microphone turned on. Have you seen How are we doing, Illinois? <laughs> have you ever fallen out of a tree? Have I ever fallen out of a tree? Um, I so I have I've come close I would say I think I don't know if you guys could see the picture on the last that last slide where I uh, there was a big branch that had um, that had fallen so what actually happened that day is, is I I had um, shot my, with my used my slingshots shot that little weight bag over the branch got my rope over we tested it we bounced on it a bunch of times and it was fine. I got onto that onto my rope, started climbing. I climbed about um, maybe 15, 20 feet up, and then I heard a crack sound, and all of a sudden I was only five feet off the ground. So um, the the branch it wasn't the branch I was actually on, but another one it was leaning against had had broken. So I had to get off of that that rope really quickly, and then um, I, I ended up climbing on the other side of that tree. Um, so I, I had to climb up the other side of the tree, push the branch that had broken down to the ground so that it wouldn't fall on us later on. And then I was about to start setting up my camera. And at the moment I put my hand on a, bran a branch on the other side, um, a, a swarm of wasps came out of the tree and was attacking my face. 
So um, it was, I've, I've never, those are the, probably the closest I've come from really falling all the way down to the ground. And luckily I just, I, I fell maybe like 10 feet and was still on my rope. Um, but it is another risk that you, that you take. I know a lot of other canopy researchers um, and there's many, many different stories of people having an accident. Um, you can always make a mistake no matter how often you've done this. So you really, really have to be careful and you have to be very focused while you're in the tree. All right, so we're gonna take a little trip back to Canada, uh, Ontario this time. This is uh, Mangali Sotos. Uh, second, third graders are hanging out with us. Let me get that microphone on. How are we doing boys and girls? What are some different nocturnal animals you call on camera? Oh, that's a good, another good question. Um, yeah, so nocturnal animals are animals that live um, live uh, at at night. Um, they are they're mostly active at night. Um, animals that are out during the day are called diurnal. And there's actually other animals that are mostly active at dawn and dusk, and those animals are called crepuscular. Um, but yeah, the, the nocturnal animals that I see, um, it's actually most, most of the species that I capture on the cameras are nocturnal. I know I showed you a bunch of pictures of, of monkeys and, and stuff like that that are out and squirrels that are out during the day, but most of the activity is actually at night, which is part of what makes it really difficult to study these animals because they live in the most inconvenient part of the forest for us to get to, but also they're out at a really difficult time for us to, to see them and, and, uh, and study them. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, like one of some of my favorite animals are, are those flying squirrels that I showed you. All the, all the flying squirrels are um, in, in the areas I've worked in are nocturnal. Um, there's also uh, animals called kinkajous and, uh, and olingos. Those are the ones that uh, they're related to raccoons but they kind of look like a cross between a cat and a teddy bear. Um, a, a kinkajous have actually what's called a prehensile tail. So they, with their tail, they can grip, they can like grip onto a branch and they can hold themselves upside down with that, uh, with that tail. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's the, I'm, I'm always very partial to, uh, to nocturnal animals just cause that's, that's what the majority of the species we see are. Um, I think in Panama, actually, my favorite animal is there's a, a porcupine called a, a Rothschild's porcupine that lives its entire life up in the trees. Um, it also has that prehensile tail, so it can hang hang from that. Um, and uh, it's only ever out at night. So it's, it can be really, really difficult to see in, in real life, which is why the, the photos are really helpful. All right, we've got one more patient class to visit. Uh, joining us on camera, Mrs. Kempe's class is in Ontario as well. There's some fourth graders. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, fourth graders? What are some of the main causes of sickness, death, or extinction in the species you have studied? Oh, that's another really good question. Um, I'm, oh, am I muted? I'm, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, that is, that's another really good question. Um, you know, I think, I think um, one of the main things that I have seen in the past is uh, there in one of the, the sites I worked at in Panama, they went through a really, really bad drought year. And so because of the drought, a lot of the fruit trees that they, they rely on throughout the year that the animals rely on, the fruit trees weren't able to produce very much. Um, and then as a result, the, the animals that, that need that fruit weren't able to find enough, uh, enough food that year. So the, there was one year where we were finding animals that had basically starved to death um, during the dry season, which is a, the, a really difficult, difficult time of year for them. So that, that is, I mean, that's one of the, the other risks of, um, uh, with climate change, um, but it is, that's sort of been one of the main, main things that I've witnessed personally of animals that are, uh, are at risk. Um, another thing is just there's certain areas where there's still a lot of poaching or, or hunting in general um, that, that happens, um, or, or even just general sort of development as roads get built, then they cut down sections of forest and stuff. So there are a lot of different things that can, can threaten the animals that I've been studying. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, it's and it, it it there's a whole bunch of different things happening all over the world. So. All right, well, Kevin, I think we can grab another question from online. And this class is wondering, they're a third grade class in Tennessee, and they're wondering, you know, you listed some, uh, some hazards, whether it's ants or branches or monkeys shaking the rope, maybe even weather. Um, what is it that drives you to keep going up into the trees and doing what you do? Yeah, that's that's another really good question. My mom asks me that all the time, actually, <laughs> why why I keep doing this. Um, I you know what? It part of it is that it is it's really special to know. Uh, you know, every time you've climbed one of like a tree that has never been climbed before, they call a, a wild tree. Um, they're all wild trees, really, but uh, a tree that that nobody's ever been in before is is called a wild tree. Um, and there is something really special about like being able to go into this this space, uh, knowing that nobody else has really seen seen the forest from that vantage point before, um, and just knowing that like because not a lot of people have been doing that, every bit of information you collect is something that's new and important and and relevant. Um, so that's been a big part of it. Um, I think uh, you know, I, I like honestly, like a big part of it is also that like as much as there are risks and and you have to be really careful and it can be dangerous in different ways, um, it's also really fun. It's fun to do that. I uh, you know, I'm fortunate in that like I don't have a huge fear of heights, although that's a pretty innate human human uh, trait. Most most people are afraid to, afraid of heights to some extent. Um, but the more you do it, the more you get accustomed to it and you just kind of get get used to it. And it's it's really fun to do. I, I've always been really active. I've always I always wanted to do field work that allowed me to to sort of get out and like hike into the forest and do 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 uh, really um, sort of active work. And this is this was what I what I found and what I've I've stuck with over the years. So. All right. Well, Kevin, I know there's tons of more questions with all the classrooms, but we are quickly coming to the end of our event for today. So I'm wondering if you'd be all right if maybe the classrooms who still had questions uh, tweeted some to you later today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So I believe it's McLean underscore K-A. Yep, that's it. Perfect. So McLean underscore K-A on Twitter, if you want to tweet some more questions uh, Kevin's way as well. If you took any pictures today, uh, in your classroom of today's event, share them on Twitter, hashtag Explore Classroom, tag at Nat Geo Education, of course, tag Kevin as well, so we can see your classrooms in action. And Kevin, a huge thank you uh, for today. It was lots of fun hanging out, great footage from the canopy, and I hope that one day in the future we can get you back up in the canopy with one of our satellite units. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys. It was so good to, to meet all of you. All right. Well, the last thing we'll do for today is I'm going to turn on the microphones. Boys and girls, let's get nice and loud. I see they've started already. Here we go. <laughs> Always so good at that part. You never let us down. Kevin, again, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Great, and we'll see you guys next week uh, when we have some more Explorer Classroom. So thanks again, everyone.